1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, we will start chapter 4 here, then just chapter 5, and then uh, we will be through with 1 Peter, but that'll still take a while. Um, suffering is what we've been talking about. <clears throat> suffering in a fallen world. Uh, how to suffer well, how to follow the example of Christ. Um, especially believers are going to suffer in a ho hostile, fallen world. It's a world that's hostile to uh, Christ. It's hostile to the people who follow Jesus Christ. And uh, so we, um, we're going to see that actually in verse 12 coming up here in chapter 4, but we'll read it now. Um, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So we're told here, and again, we'll, we'll preach on that in uh, the next few Peter sermons. We'll get to that. But we're told to not be surprised. Don't be surprised when a fiery trial comes your way. It will come your way. Again, this book is being written to believers who are being persecuted. They're being blamed for burning down the city, uh, even though the emperor is the one who did that. And uh, there, it was not easy to be a believer um, in this time period. Jesus tells us as well in John 16 that there will be tribulation. And he says, but, but have peace because I've overcome the world. And so we will have suffering. We've been learning how to suffer well, how to pursue righteousness, even while suffering for righteousness' sake. Uh, and we talked about that in terms of the government. Uh, even when a government is, is crooked, even when a government is twisted and unjust, um, the government's put there to keep order and to keep law and to keep God's statutes in place here on earth. Uh, but in a fallen world, it doesn't always work that way. We talked about that. We talked about the slave and master relationship and how uh, in different forms uh, with sin, that couldn't go wrong. And that wasn't what it was intended to be by God as more of an employee-employer relationship to protect people, but unfortunately became sinful. And we were instructed in those circumstances under oppressive leadership how to suffer well, how to suffer even for doing good and how to stay righteous in that. And then spouses in our homes, husbands and wives, even with an unbelieving husband, even with a harsh man, how does the wife submit and how does the wife uh, be a witness for Jesus Christ there? And so we've been talking about all of this to be Christ-like even in our suffering. As believers, we are learning this uh, in First Peter. And so today... Uh, um, we're going to hearken back to chapter 3 just a little bit here, where we see that Christ suffered for us on the cross to bring us to sinners. And that's back in 3.18. And so if you have your Bible, look back there now. It said, Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Then it goes on to talk about, even in the days of Noah, salvation being offered, uh, a way of escape from God's wrath being offered to those who would listen and those who would heed. And that through water baptism, we make an appeal to God through faith for a clean conscience, for our sins to be wiped away by Jesus Christ. That's where the text was right before today. And Christ is now ascended into heaven. He's at the right hand of God with the angels, the authorities, the powers having been subjected to him. So that's where we are. We're learning about Christ suffering for us to bring us to God, us sinners, offering sinful man a chance at salvation, to be saved from God's just wrath, Offering man a clear conscience and a state of total forgiveness. All of that through his death and resurrection. So that was chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. Today now, we're instructed in this text to not only look to the suffering of Christ during our suffering, which again, we will have. If you're not suffering now, you will. Maybe because of your faith. Maybe because you live in a fallen world. But you will. You will suffer. And we need to go to the Word. And we need to entrust ourselves uh, to God and the Father the way that Jesus Christ did in His suffering. And follow Christ's example. And so we have talked about that and talked about that. The Scripture has talked about that. So not only today are we yet again reminded to look to the suffering of Christ. Uh, looking back to that chapter 3 that it helps us in our suffering and how we suffer for righteousness sake and how we stay righteous in our suffering and how we honor God and how we're a witness to Jesus Christ even in our suffering. Not only that, but today uh, through suffering uh, and through looking at the example of Christ's suffering, 
we're, we're exhorted to, to put away sin. We're exhorted to, uh, the old timers would call that mortification of sin or mortifying sin. Uh, that through suffering, uh, sin can, can be displaced in the life of a believer. And uh, third, we're called today to understand that the gospel is the remedy for sin. Gospel is the only remedy for sin. And so we'll get into the text. Um, Christ's suffering on our behalf is the only remedy for sin. So verse 1, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So, verse 1 starts with the word since. Since basically is saying, when you see this in the scripture, since this is true, since this thing you just read is true, and now it's going to say, now, now do this, or respond this way, or since this is true, this other thing is then true. So we learn that Christ suffered for sin, a righteous for the unrighteous that he might bring us to God. We learn that salvation is offered to us and that through an appeal to God for a clear conscience, through faith, we are saved and Christ is in heaven at the right hand of God. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh to accomplish that for us, to bring us to God, and since he conquered all of that on our, on our behalf, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. So the therefore there, since therefore, since Christ did this for you, arm yourselves. So again, that all points back to chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking since Christ suffered in the flesh. Suffered in the flesh is a uh, reference to the cross there. He was falsely accused. He was mocked. He was scourged. He was beaten. And then he was crucified. He suffered in the flesh on behalf of us. Uh, for our sake. In one's stead is what the, what the language there means. Since he suffered in the flesh uh, for us. When, when, you, when, you, when you go up to the 18 and look at the righteous for the unrighteous. This is, he suffers on our behalf. He suffers for our sake. He suffers in our stead. So since he's done that, we look to that example and we arm ourselves, the text says. We arm ourselves with the same way of thinking. Arm yourself there means to equip oneself. It's, um, it's, it's a soldier putting on his armor, is what this is. A soldier equipping himself and putting on his armor. As a soldier wouldn't go out into the battlefield without the armor, nor should the Christian go into the battlefield of the world without his armor. Nor should the Christian try to, uh, try to exude any righteousness without his armor, without being equipped, without arming himself or herself with the same way of thinking that Jesus Christ has. So we arm ourselves with the same way of thinking. The same way of thinking here is the same purpose, it's the same attitude, and the same state of mind. So we are to equip ourselves with the same purpose that Christ had, the same state of mind that Christ had, the same attitude that Christ had. And we'll see in a moment what that attitude was once we kind of pick through some of these words. It was an attitude of being obedient to the Father. It was an attitude of accomplishing God's will here on earth, not his own will. The text goes on, arm ourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Ceased there means to restrain. So whoever has suffered in the flesh is restrained from sin, has desisted from sin, has caused pause in sin, has prohibited, stopped, or left off sin. Whoever has suffered in the flesh has left off sin. And the reason given, look at verse 2. So we're to arm ourselves with the way Christ thinks, about suffering, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. The reason to do that, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, that's here on earth, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Now, we're not skipping over that. We're going to go and talk about this difficult statement here. Whoever suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. But to get the whole picture, 
The reason we do it, look at verse 2, the word so as. That's the reason, so as to do this. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So we're told here to arm ourselves with the same way of thinking as Christ, because whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Thus, then, living the rest of their life here on earth, not for their own lusts, desires, cravings, that's what that word means, uh, that word um, passions there, lusts, desires, cravings, not to live for that, but to live for the will of God. And we see that this is a battle. We arm ourselves. It's a battle, and it's a battle against sin, and it's a battle against our tendency to revile back in suffering. It's our battle against the tendency to live for our own passions. So, to arm ourselves, one, it is a battle. Two, we must be prepared to suffer like Christ. Christ said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. I'm paraphrasing. But the world hated Christ. The world still hates Christ. The world will hate Christ's followers. And he warned us about this. But Jesus, he purposed to suffer rather than to sin. He, uh, um, I, and that's, I, I like how uh, Merrill Unger puts it that way. He purposed to suffer rather than to sin. Flip to Philippians 2. In Philippians 2, you see this. I keep missing it in here. <laughs> it's in there somewhere. <clears throat> there we go. Tiny little pages in this thing. <clears throat> and it's kind of new. I haven't used it much. So it's like everything's, you, you flop at the whole 13 books to the side. Philippians 2, I'm sorry. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Christ uh, purposed to suffer rather than to sin. Philippians 2, starting in verse 5. Well, let's start in verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind, and it's very similar to what we're hearing today. Have this mind among you, I'm sorry, among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So Christ, rather than purpose for himself, remember, he was in the garden and said, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. If there's any other way than the cross, let's do that plan. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Do you remember that? And he chooses here, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He obeyed God right to the cross. God the Father. So rather than sinning, rather than saying, no, Father, I'm not going to that cross. I don't deserve this. Because he didn't deserve it. That happened on our behalf. We're the sinners. We're the ones living our lives full of passions, full of lusts. Not Christ. We're the ones in idolatry. Sinners. That's us. That's not Christ. But rather than state his case, he was obedient to the Father's will. He had purposed in his life here on earth that he would do the Father's will. And so we are called here to arm ourselves with that same way of thinking. That we purpose ourselves on this planet to do the Father's will. Not my own will. Not my own passions. Not my own lusts and desires and cravings. But the Father's will. What he wants. The same way of thinking. We think like Christ. We commit ourselves to accomplishing God's will, and even, even if that means to suffer. And for Christians, sometimes that does mean that we'll suffer. Christ entrusted himself to the Father. When he was reviled, he didn't revile back. He did it for the good of others. He did it even for his own enemies. Even from the cross, he says, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He does that for others, not for himself. And he does it to honor God. And so we're called to that same way of thinking. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking of Christ as Christ 
because, again, look at the, the text back in uh, 1 Peter 4 now. Whoever, for, whoever, and that word for there is, is, is kind of like a because. For, since, or because are kind of synonymous. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For, because, whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Then again, the reason, so as to live the rest of the time no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Um, there's different theories on here. And uh, I'll give you the people smarter than me. Um, uh, they word this better than I could. Uh, so I'll give you, the, the, here's the, here are the, what does this mean? Whoever has suffered has ceased from sin. Well, we know it doesn't mean that if you've suffered in this life, you are no longer a sinner. You do not sin, practically speaking. We know it isn't that. Because everybody in this room has suffered, and everybody in this room still sins. And so we know it isn't that. Um, Constable says this, and these are kind of the basic theories on what this is. Constable says that... Um, Paul, uh, Peter's readers here have identified with Christ's suffering and his death through water baptism, which we saw in chapter 3. They should then put sin behind them and live a clean life. That suffering should lead to a more holy life. It doesn't always, but it should. Suffering in Scripture does have a purifying effect, and we'll get into that in a moment. Merrill Unger says, as, and I quote, as physical death frees a man from sin... So, it's, he's kind of saying the same thing. So, he who identifies himself with Christ's redemptive suffering. Now, that's anybody who places their faith in Christ. I'm identifying with Christ. I'm placing myself in Christ. I'm identifying with his suffering. So, anyone who identifies himself with Christ's redemptive suffering should reckon thereof no longer responding to the strong sinful passions of men while he lives on earth, but responding to the will of God for his life. I agree with both of those things, both true. Um, so their interpretation of this is what this is saying is, in, in, and I agree with this, in chapter 3, believers are identifying themselves through water baptism, through, through, the, through the ordinance of water baptism. They're identifying, uh, we're taught in Romans that they're identifying with Christ's suffering, with his death, with his burial, and with his resurrection. And so therefore... Uh, they have, they have, as a physical death frees you from sin, the spiritual death frees you legally from sin. You are forgiven. So you've suffered because you've been identified with Christ and suffered and, and your old self has died and thus you're freed from sin. You are forgiven. You are judicially, legally justified. And so that's... Um, one way to look at it, the other way to look at it, and again, I think there's truth in both of these, is that uh, in the Nelson, uh, uh, my New King James Study Bible notes would agree with this one, um, that, that suffering tends to have a purifying effect on us. That suffering in Scripture, one of the purposes is to purify us and to bring us closer to Christ. Um, turn to Romans 5 on that note. Turn to Romans 5. Starting in verse 3, we can see that suffering produces endurance, character, and hope that does not disappoint because the Holy Spirit's been poured out on us. That's what we're taught here in Romans 5. Romans 5, verse 3. We rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So, endurance there, it also means patience. Christ endured. He entrusted himself in that suffering instead of reviling back and sinning. When we endure, there's a purifying effect, right? Rather than reviling, rather than uh, punching somebody in the face, whatever we want to do when we're sinned against, as we've been taught all through chapter 3, instead of doing those things that our flesh would want to do, um, sometimes suffering, if we obey, can have a very purifying effect that we will endure. And when we endure, we gain this proven character. Proven character there is virtue. 
as opposed to sin. It's a proved character. It's tried and tested. That over time, your character is refined and tried and tested, and you're found to be faithful, and you're found to be obedient through suffering. And that proven character then produces hope, confident ex expectation. And that hope and that confident expectation that God will deliver, that God is in control, um, that, that expectation won't disappoint, we're told in the text there, because of the Holy Spirit who's been given to us, who's been poured out within us. So there is a purifying effect of suffering. Um, the book of James. James chapter 1, uh, 2 through 4. There again, it's right in between the books I'm in here. There we go. James chapter 1, 2 through 4 talks about this purifying effect of suffering. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Suffering has a purifying effect on us. Let that steadfastness, right? So it, he says, the testing of our faith, suffering there, is going to produce steadfastness, and that steadfastness, once it has its full effect, will, in the end, make us perfect and complete. Now, that'll never happen in lacking nothing. That won't ever happen here on earth, but that's all part of the process before we're glorified in heaven where that happens. But we're in the process of that. We're becoming more perfect and more complete. We're not all the way there yet. So suffering does have a purifying effect. Again, the Nelson study notes say this, suffering changes our attitude towards sin. And I think there's something to that. Think about idle hands, right? What's the saying? Idle hands are the devil's playground. Why is that? Because when everything's good and there's lots of money and there's lots of food and there's lots of prosperity, what happens? Look at all through scripture, what happens? Sin, sin, sin. We have no need for God. We have all kinds of leisure and time on our hands and what do we find to do? Sin, because it's human nature. Um, so, uh, while suffering so is, has a purifying effect, uh, we can't take that too far because this verse here is used to teach the, uh, the idea of purgatory, which is absolutely not scriptural. Now, purgatory is uh, uh, this, this holding place. The, the, the Catholic Church would teach that it's a holding place between here and heaven. And so, because of your sin, you're not good enough to go to heaven yet. And so, basically, you go there to where you're purified through fire, then you're ready for heaven. And that is not scriptural. That's not what this verse teaches. Um, this verse isn't saying that. This passage isn't saying that. Uh, what's being said here, again, is that suffering does tend to have a purifying effect. And when we identify with the suffering of Christ, we have died to sin. We have died to self. And we are no longer live for our own passions, but increasingly live for the will of God if we arm ourselves with the same thinking, if we're willing to suffer with Christ and if we're willing to suffer like Christ, then, then we will increasingly cease from sin. So the reason, and again, that's the reason given, to arm ourselves and cease from sin, is to live not for our own passions, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So we're to arm ourselves to suffer, arm ourselves to fight against sin, and that'll change our attitude towards sin. I should have stayed in Romans. Flip back to Romans 6. We do no longer live for our own passions since we've been saved. It's like, uh, I, don't, I don't know much about... You know, Jim and I were talking the other day about being an EMT, firefighter. I don't know much about these things. Jim, let me ask you a question. How many times, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I think it's an easy answer. How many times have you ever seen somebody uh, just repeatedly run back into the burning building once you've saved them, once you've pulled them out? Right? I get maybe somebody goes in to try to, to fetch a loved one or something like that, but... but on, you know what I'm saying, right? That's what returning to our sin is like. We've been saved by Christ out of the fire of his wrath, and we're going to just keep going back because there's something enticing there and there's something alluring, alluring there. And we're told not to do that. 
Thanks for participating today, Jim. <laughs> sorry, sorry to drag you into it. Um, I didn't plan that. That's not in my notes. That just came off my head. Um, but that's what this is like. Or if you're pulled out of a lake where you almost drown, are you going to jump right back in? You're going to be a little scared of that. But you know, as humans in our sinful home, we're not scared of sin, are we? We're not scared to stay away from that. It just came into my mind. I wish I had it in my notes because I don't know where it is. Um, it's in the Psalms or the Proverbs, one of them. I don't remember which. Um, can a man hold fire to his chest and not be burned? I think it's Proverbs. That's where we are, right? Well, we're saved from sin, now I'm forgiven, and now I'm going to hold this fire real close to my chest and expect not to get burned. Expect that I'm not going to be damaged by sin. We're called to no longer live for our passions. Romans 6, anyway, uh, verse 2. Um, are we to, well, verse 1, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Because we're forgiven. And, and what he's been saying here, Paul, previously, is that, you know, where there's more sin, there's just more grace from God. And so he says, but hold on. So are we then to continue in sin so that grace may abound even more? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Do you see the connection there? He who has suffered has ceased from sin. We identify with his suffering, just like was just explained right there just now. And so, thus, we cease from sin. But we're to no longer live for those passions. Uh, look at verse 7 in Romans 6. For no one who has died, I'm sorry, for one who has died has been set free from sin. And then verse 11, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Man, go home and read Romans 6. It's fantastic. Um, Ephesians 4 is another, another, exhortation to the same thing, another explanation to this same uh, principle. Ephesians 4, 17, Now this I say in testifying the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous, and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Uh, and he goes on, verse 22, Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And so those are three exhortations that are the same here. Um, we are to no longer live for our own passions and the way that we do that is to arm ourselves with the same thinking of Jesus Christ the same way that he thought to purpose to do the will of God to purpose to entrust ourselves to his power and his strength and do it through his spirit just like Jesus did Jesus didn't do anything on his own accord. He said that. Neither should we as believers. Mike's teaching us that in Galatians, right? That it isn't this effort that we do. It's our fellowship with, with the Lord that we do. So, these desires, these passions, James tells us they, give, they conceive and then they give birth to sin. So our question for us today, how are we doing this? Do we, are we arming ourselves with the mind of Christ? Are we... Uh, you know, what, what are our, go home and think about this, write this down. What sins do I need to repent of? What areas am I living for my own passions? Psalm 139, 23 and 24. We'll pray it together today in the middle of this sermon. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's pray that this week. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So we're to live for the will of God.
And so we ask ourselves, whose will are we seeking to accomplish? We have to ask ourselves, do we know God's will? We can't accomplish God's will if we don't know God's will, and we won't know God's will unless we're in the Word, unless we're spending regular time with God in the Word and in prayer. We're going to drift further from His will and further into our own ways. <clears throat> and this permeates everything we do, our decisions, our thoughts, our actions. Whose will? Whose purpose am I serving? In our relationships, in our finances, in our time spent, in the music we listen to, in the TV we watch, and the conversations we have, all of it. We're to arm ourselves and live for the will of God just like Jesus did because, because verse 3 says, for the time that is past, the time that is past has, suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. I guess we'll stop there. Um, the time has passed for us. We're believers now. The time has passed for us to live like this. Gentiles there means unbelievers. Um, sensuality there. The time has passed for us to, to, to seek the things like the Gentiles do. Sensuality is, um, this is a word you don't hear, lasciviousness. It means filth. Uh, unbridled lust and shamelessness. Passions there means lusts and desires. Drunkenness is excess of wine or an overflow of wine, which impairs your senses and makes all these other things worse sometimes. Um, orgies there, reveling, rioting, lewd, immoral feasting is what this is. Big, lewd parties. Drinking parties in our text. Um, Carousing or a drinking bout is how the, uh, the Greek um, dictionaries read there. Lawless idolatry there is unlawful, illegal, abominable, illicit, criminal, wicked, and activities that are contrary to justice. That's lawless idolatry. So Constable points out, note the prominence of sexual and alcohol-related activities there. Um, this is how unbelievers often live. Um, but, but in Christ, we, we should be moving away from those things. Um, and we know that even believers get sucked into this stuff, and they get sucked into it big time. Look at the, the letters to the Corinthians. There were believers being, you know, very involved in this stuff. And again, we've, we've, been, in, uh, we've been in churches where, you know, people have been sucked into this stuff. So... Um, that's not to say there's not forgiveness. That's not to say there's not the strength of the Lord to help us in these matters. But we're instructed in the scripture that when these things are revealed, um, we should be taking steps to, to get the help we need. We should be taking steps to talk to the people we need to talk to, um, to pray to the Lord, and to be working those things out. And obviously, uh, in this church, your leadership's always here for that. Um, and if we're not qualified, we'll find somebody who is. Because we don't know everything. Mike knows a lot, but we don't know everything. So, uh, just a little side note uh, on the counseling side of things and the shepherding side of things that none of this is a condemnation to beat anybody over the head with. Um, if, if anybody has or does struggle there or anybody listening to us out in internet land, um, this isn't a uh, condemnation. You're in hell now. This is, a, this is an exhortation to believers in Jesus Christ um, to not live for your own passions anymore, but to seek the will of God every single day. And you do that by arming yourself with the same attitude that Christ had, even while he suffered. Um, verse 4. With respect to this, all these sins, they, the, the, the Gentiles, the sinners who are doing these things, with respect to this, now you can see this is a lifestyle of just partying and sex and, and all this stuff. That's what he's describing here. Just a lifestyle of lewd, drunken, sexual uh, lack of control in all aspects. Now, verse 4, with respect to this, they, the people who do that, are surprised when you, as a believer, do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. debauchery and they malign you. Anybody ever experienced that? Um, I have, actually. Uh, they, I have had people not understand why I don't want to go do these certain things with them back like when I first became a believer. Not so much now because that yeah, kind of stuff sort of weeds itself out. But even like at work and stuff, sometimes there are some things that happen or conversations that happen. And it is. It's like people are surprised when you're just not 
in on this stuff, right? But it says here that the unbeliever is actually surprised and shocked, is what the word means there, when you don't join in this sin. Um, they think it's strange. They're amazed, they're, they're staggered by this, that you don't participate in their flood of debauchery. Flood there is excess. Debauchery is there an abandoned, dissolute life. I had to look up what does dissolute mean. That means uh, lacking restraint. So just lost all abandon, just no restraint, just a flood of unrestrained sin, passion, and lust is what's being described here. And they'll malign you when you don't participate. Number one, they can't even believe that you're not going to, and then they malign you. They speak evil, they revile you, they slander you. Christians will be mocked, you will be maligned for, for attempting to live a pure life. Let that not um, stop us, though. So verse 5, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. They will give an account. Though they speak evil of our lack of participation, they will stand before God who will judge. To give an account there, it's to give a speech, to give a discord, uh, to, to reckon themselves, a plea, a motive, or a reason. They will stand before God and give a plea, a motive, or a reason. You'll stand before God and have to explain yourself. And everyone's going to have to do that. So we better be in Christ. Those of us in Christ, um, we're covered. To judge there means to make a decision. A judicial, like a court of law kind of decision, okay? So those folks will give an account. Good news is coming. They'll give an account to him who is ready to judge, who's ready to make this decision judicially, the living and the dead. And the living and the dead there, the living is being judged in this life, the temporal judgments, the, the consequences for sin. And, and the reference to the dead there is that... Uh, this is the great white throne judgment that is to come. That everyone will be, uh, everyone will be resurrected and will go either to uh, heaven or hell based on the judgment here. Uh, we'll go to Romans 14. Romans 14, 12 tells us, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Each of us will give an account. Ecclesiastes 12, 14 says the same thing. But John chapter 5. We'll flip there quickly. Real bad today with my flipping. I'll skip right over it again. John 5. Uh, some various couple of verses here. Verses 22. And 23, this is Jesus speaking. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Down in verse 28, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Now again, we know... Christ came to save us from the wrath since no one does good. So if you're in Christ, you'll go to the resurrection. If you're not in Christ, you'll go to the judgment. So these people will give an account, and it goes on in verse 6 quickly. This is why the gospel was preached. Because sinful man revels in these things, loves these things, because they will give an account, this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. So, notice it says the gospel was preached. Now again, this sounds like the gospel is going to be preached to people who are dead right now, and they've already died, and hey, here's the gospel, be saved. That is not scriptural. That is not in scripture. Again, Hebrews 9, 27 and 28, it is appointed for man once to die, then comes the judgment. We... we taught about this back in chapter 3, there is no second chance. So this verse absolutely does not mean at all that Christ has gone to dead people and offered them salvation. That's not what it is. It says the gospel was preached to those who are dead. So many scholars here think that the gospel was heard by people while they were alive and now they're dead. The gospel was preached to these people even the people who have now died, and thankfully the gospel was preached to them, they had a chance to repent, a chance to be saved, a chance to trust in Christ. That's one theory. 
Theory two, gospel was preached to the spiritually dead, which is everybody. Everybody is the spiritually dead. Ephesians 2 tells us that. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, following the course of this world. In the ways that we once walked, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And so again, uh, this is, you know, unregenerate man is sinful. He'll face judgment. So the gospel's been preached two spiritually dead people, which we all are. And yes, the gospel was likely preached to these people who, when they were alive, now they've died. And all of us will die someday. And the question is, what did we do with the gospel? Did we place our faith in Christ? And the gospel, it says here, was preached so that. So that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. So they were judged in the flesh the way people are. That meant they, they, they were temporally judged here on earth. They were chastened. They suffered the consequences of sin on this earth. They were judged in the immediate. But their final judgment was going to be based on whether or not they trusted in Christ for salvation, just like all of us. And the second part of that physical judged in the flesh is that they die physically because the wages of sin is death. And so because of sin, we all die physically. But they, but so the gospel was preached to them because they'll face judgment so that they, although they be judged in the flesh the way men are, that they might live in the spirit. The gospel was preached to them so that they might place their faith in Christ and live in the spirit the way God does. Though they die physically, Though they were chastened at times, though they suffered consequences here on earth for their sin, they might be saved. They might live eternally with God. They might go to that, to, to the judgment and be forgiven because of Jesus Christ. We'll elaborate more on these couple. Uh, we've got to go. So we'll elaborate more on this um, verse 6. But in grand total, we arm ourselves with the same way of thinking of Christ. So that we can suffer well, so that we can suffer righteously, so that we can begin to eradicate sin in our lives. Ultimately, the gospel is the remedy, though. The gospel, even after all of that, we still come up short, and the gospel was preached. And we're called to place our faith in Christ to be saved. So let's close with... Uh, Let's close with a scripture out of Titus, chapter 3. Titus 3, starting in verse 3. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. He goes on to warn them about foolish controversies and things to avoid. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. So let's pray on that note today. Lord, your mercy is, as the song said today, your mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, but your mercy is more. As we flipped into Romans today, we know that that doesn't cause us or allow us to sin more, but rather, Lord, we are called here to live for your will, not for the passions of our own flesh, and we're to do that by arming ourselves with the same way of thinking that Christ had, and Lord, we, we need you every day for that. We're weak and we're feeble, and our minds go astray. And our bodies go astray. And Lord, we can't always walk with you the way that we ought. So forgive us for that. We corporately confess that to you this morning. And we ask for your strength.
We need your Holy Spirit to empower us to do these things. Our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. So Lord, help us today. Help us to, um, to submit to you and have you search our hearts. Help us to uh, reach out to you for your grace and your mercy so that we might live for your will. We're thankful that Jesus Christ suffered on our behalf to bring us, us sinners, to God. We're thankful, Lord, that, that he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Even though he was fully God, he, he humbled himself to the point of death on our behalf. We thank you for that, Lord, and we ask you to remind us of that every day. Remind us of our weakness. Remind us of our need for you. Remind us of our, our uh, absolute dependence 100% of the time on Jesus Christ. We thank you for his grace and his mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you have brought us, brought our feet into a wide place in Christ. And it's in his name today that we pray. Amen.